بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Lord of the heavens and the earth and we ask him to send his peace and blessings upon our master Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his blessed family, his loyal companions and all of those who followed after with excellence up until the day of standing. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Thereafter, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he was sent as a prophet and messenger, but nevertheless he was still part of the Meccan and Medinan society and part of a household in which he grew up and later on a household that he administered, a household that he brought up. So the life of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, like the prophets and messengers before him is a very unique life as a religious leader who is also engaged in family life. Uh, sometimes people have the perspective that somebody who is of a, a religious background or is a religious leader should not necessarily be engaging in, in public life or in family life as the rest of us human beings do so. But this is far from the case in the prophets and messengers that they were engaged in family life and in the societies that they lived in uh, as any other human being. This is why we see when the Meccans uh, try to point fingers towards the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and deny his prophethood and messengership, one of the things that they said was that if he was a prophet, why is he walking in the marketplaces? If he is a prophet, then why is he marrying? If he is a prophet, then he should sit at home and revelation should come to him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied to that and he said, had we had the inhabitants of the earth been angels we would have sent an angel as a messenger to them but because the inhabitants of the earth are human beings we have sent our messengers and prophets as human beings so that mankind can not only learn from them how to uh, conduct their dealings with their creator and lord and the afterlife but also know how to live as human beings upon the earth and to have the greatest and the best of examples in that. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, you have a beautiful example. You have a beautiful example as to how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have a beautiful example as to how to live in society and interact with others. And especially how to interact with your families, with your wives, with your children, with your siblings, with your parents, and so on and so forth. So we see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has this amazing uh, aspect to his noble life which makes life easier for all of us in that we did not have to seek uh, our religious guidance from him and go elsewhere to seek our social uh, uh, guidance for our social interaction but rather Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave us everything in one and that's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is why the poet, he said, وَلَيْسَ بِمُسْتَنْكِرٍ عَلَى اللَّهِ أَنْ يَجْمَعَ الْعَالَمَ فِي وَاحِدِي And it's not far-fetched for Allah for him to gather all of the goodness of the world in one, i.e. the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Naam. So we see the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the in different aspects of his noble life. And some of those aspects are perhaps not as, as spoken about as they should be. So for example, the Prophet ﷺ spoke about his physical strength and he said, Allah has given me the physical strength of 40 men. And in another narration he said, Allah has given me the physical strength of 400 men from the men of paradise. And these men that he is speaking about are not the biscuit men of our time. You touch them and their bones break. Right? These are the men like Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu anhu. Sayyidina Hamza, what type of man was he? He would go into the deserts of, the, of Arabia. He would go into the deserts of Arabia and he would hunt down a lion, not a deer. He would hunt down a lion, shoot it, kill it, and then strip its skin, place it in the sun, let it dry, and then he would put it on his shoulder and walk in the streets of Makkah. Why would he do this? 
to show the Meccans, if I can strip down a lion like this, then beware of me, <laughs> I, I, I can do it to you too, right? When Sayyidina Umar would walk in the streets of Mecca, people would move aside, huh? because they knew of his might, they knew of his strength. The Prophet ﷺ was given much more strength, much more might than Sayyidina Hamza and Sayyidina Umar put together and all of the men of Mecca. He said, I was given the strength of 400 men. In the battlefields, when he attended in Badr and in Uhud and in Khandaq and in Hunayn and in all of the expeditions that he went out to, the Sahaba described him in those battles and said, if we wanted to find the Prophet, we would not find him retreating, relaxing, uh, 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 backstage, but rather we would have to go into the most fierce areas of battlefield to see that he was there all alone. In the most difficult of situations where none of us would dare to go, the Prophet ﷺ would be there. Why? Because of the might, bravery, courage and strength that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon him. Rukana was the most, um, he, he was the strongest uh, wrestler in the Arabian Peninsula. And he was known to be the strongest. Nobody could ever defeat him. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Muhammad ﷺ, if you can defeat me, then I will believe that you are a prophet. Because he didn't believe that anybody could defeat him. So therefore, he wouldn't have accepted. The Messenger of Allah said, fine. Any challenge that was put to him, he was ready for it. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him every quality of goodness. Allah gave him every quality of strength and might. He had to be the greatest of all people of all times. And nobody could have a quality or a character or a strength that was greater than him. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the Messenger of Allah agreed with him. They both stood. The Messenger of Allah grabbed him and he was down to the ground. Rukana was shocked. He didn't know what happened. He thought he was dreaming. He said, let's try again. The Messenger of Allah stood up. He grabbed him by his hand and he had him down again. He said, let's try a third time. The Messenger of Allah grabbed him and he was down. Rukana couldn't believe what happened and he immediately accepted Islam. Why? Because of the strength of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. We see this aspect of his blessed life, of his might and his strength. And we see that in Makkah al Mukarramah, all of the Meccans, or most of the Meccans, they, they went against him after the age of 40. When he reached this age of absolute maturity, now they are going against him, pointing fingers at him, saying he's a liar, he is a magician, he is, he is mad, and so on and so forth. But look at the bravery of the Prophet. Look at his determination, look at his strength. None of that, what they were saying, stopped him uh, or came in between him and his job, between him and what he was propagating. And none of that affected him such that he would take out his anger on somebody. He would never take out his anger on somebody. Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha said, Man taqama Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ali nafsihi qat. He never took avenge for himself ever. He never took avenge for himself ever. And this is something very important for us to understand. Perhaps you might be at work, had a really hard day at work. Huh? The boss was really giving you a hard time. Your colleagues were uh, plotting against you to get you dismissed from the company. Right? You come home and all of that anger and that uh, rage comes out on who? The people at home. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't like this. The Meccans treated him in such a way that if that was the situation of a normal person, perhaps they would have committed suicide. Perhaps they would have done such and such and such and such. They would have become violent, become abusive, become like a monster. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, look at his inner bravery and his courage and his strength in that he did not let uh, how the Meccans treated him affect his relationship with anybody. With anybody. You know, uh, something very amazing about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he lost so many members of his family. He lost so many members of his family. First he lost his wife Khadija. 
then he lost his uncle Abu Talib, then he lost his three daughters, uh, he lost his male children in Makkah, he lost his male children all in infancy in Makkah, he lost all of his female children except for Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha. Before the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa left from this world, he had lost all of his children except for Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha. He buried all of his children in his lifetime. Such, if somebody has to bury one of their children, it breaks their back forever, right? And they can barely stand. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went through test after test, tribulation after tribulation, but yet his interaction with people was not affected by the tests that Allah had placed upon him. One companion, he said, from the day that I accepted Islam, never did the Messenger of Allah see me except that he smiled. He said, never that he spoke except that he smiled. Even though you would think, sometimes you meet people and you see them with miserable faces, you see them so low and down, you ask them, what's wrong? And they say, if what had gone, if what has passed me of tests had gone upon you, you wouldn't even be standing. Let alone me having a miserable face and not smiling and having a long face, you would not even be standing had what has passed me, had it passed you. But the Prophet wasallam, he was very much different to this in that he did not let his personal tests, the tribulations Allah sent upon him, he did not let them affect his relationship with his family, with his, uh, with his companions, with those who he interacted with. So we see that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, had great might, physical strength, and he had also inner strength and courage. And let's ask his family members how the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was with them. Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha, she was living with the Prophet وسلم, in the Medinan pre period, not in the Meccan period. Do you know why? In Makkah, he only had Khadija radiallahu anha. The scholars have said something really beautiful about Sayyidah Khadija. They said, the reason why he only had Khadija radiallahu anha in Makkah, because the tests of Makkah were so severe, only a woman like Khadija would have been able to bear them. She was a very strong woman. She was an aged woman. She was an experienced woman. She had done business. She had done business. She had... Uh, she was married twice before the Prophet She had children before him She she was well known. She was uh, famous, right? She had all of these qualities of goodness in her. So therefore, she was able to bear the burdens of Makkah. No other woman would have been able to do that. Whereas Sayyidah Aisha lived the Medina life with the Prophet and that wasn't an easy life too. The Medina life was not an easy life for the Prophet ﷺ also. If you look through the Medinan life, you see one battle doesn't finish except that they move over to the next one. One expedition doesn't finish except that the Prophet makes an announcement, let's go out again, defending the borders of Islam time and time again. Yet when Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha was asked, how was the Messenger of Allah ﷺ at home? This is something very important. It's to know the private and the public life of your leader. The modern world is very much different to this. The modern world is, you see the celebrities on the television screens, on the screens of your phones, and that's it. They don't let you follow, follow, they don't let you follow them to their homes. They don't let paparazzi outside their homes taking pictures and trying to intrude, intrude into their private lives. Why? Because their private lives are absolutely different to their public lives. There's no match. It was from the miracles and the truthfulness of his prophethood that his private life and his public life were absolutely the same. So this is why he would encourage his companions to go and ask his wives, how was the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa at home? Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha said, Kana basam al dahaka. He used to smile and laugh. He used to smile and laugh with his wives. He used to sit and talk to them. What kind of he not He used to help out in bits and pieces at home. Kana yahli bushata huwa yuraqi usawba huwa yaqsifu alahu. He used to go and milk the sheep, mend his clothes, patch his sandals. He used to do what men do at home, right? And he was easy going with his blessed wives. He would sit down and speak with them. In the uh, in the shmail of Imam Tirmidhi radiyallahu anhu, we have an entire chapter uh, which is 
babu ma jaa fi samri rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the chapter concerning the night talk of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam with his blessed wives he would sit them down and he would talk to them he would tell them stories and he would listen to what they had to got to say what they had to say now the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wasn't free all day he wasn't relaxing all day rather he was extremely busy from the time that he woke up to the time he went back home he had to deal with all of the affairs of his companions he had to think about the military of islam he had to de- think about the ministry of justice the mis- ministry of of law he was the leader of all of the ministries of madinatul munawwara he had to think about the enemies that were constantly bombarding him and the borders of islam he had to worry about what the Meccans were going to plot next his companions were being killed time and time again the uh, madinatul munawwara was under attack for the 10 years he lived in Medina, Medina was always under attack. He, he had to be vigilant all the time. But yet, when he comes back home, he's smiling and laughing. He doesn't bring back the worries of Medina into his home. He doesn't bring back the, the thoughts of his enemies coming onto the borders of Medina back home. He doesn't bring uh, uh, all of the welfare of the people of Medina back home. Rather, when he enters into his home, he is dealing with the people of his home. That's why Imam Tirmidhi radiallahu anh, mentioned that his shma'il, uh, uh, that the Prophet وسلم, would divide his time in his home لِنَفْسِهِ وَلِأَهْلِهِ وَلِعَامَّةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He would divide his time for himself, for his wives, his family, and for, his, for the general public. So he would divide his time into three. Uh, the time that was for himself was for himself, the time that was for his wives and family was for them, and the time that was for the Muslims was for them. He did not muddle up between the affairs of his life. Uh, every part of his life he dealt with it individually. And this is something very important. We see that in Makkah al Mukarramah, he was living with Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha. She was a very affluent woman, she was a businesswoman. But the Prophet وسلم, didn't place his entire reliance upon Khadija and say, you know what, you provide for the home, I'm chilling, I'm relaxing, right? You go out to work, you've got a big business, you've got lots of wealth, look after your daughters, look after the home, look after the children, I've got, some, I've got to go to the masjid to pray salah. And some of the righteous, mashallah, in our community might be doing this. Uh, they're so righteous that they think they go to the masjid and pray all day long, whilst their wives are out there in the offices and in the workplaces, bringing back the bread and butter. This is not the way of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If your wife is earning, then that's good for her. Then that's good for her. You are still supposed to be the man of the home, the man of the family who is supposed to be providing bread and butter, even if your wife is earning more than you. Why? Because tomorrow in inheritance, she'll take less than you. Why she will take less than you is because everything that she has earned in her life, she doesn't have to spend it. If she spends, then that's sadaqah, that's an act of charity, that's from the goodness of her heart. That's from the goodness of her heart. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't seen in Makkah, that he gave up work. He was a shepherd in Makkah. Then he was doing business for Sayyidah Khadija before he married her. He was a businessman wasallam. He was doing trade. Nowhere we find that after he married Sayyidah Khadija, this affluent rich woman, that he gave up in doing business. Nowhere we read this. Why? Because he was the man of the house. He was the one who should bring back the bread and butter. Even though Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha was extremely kind, she was extremely generous, but her kindness and generosity was something extra. It was not something that the Prophet would depend upon such that he would give up working himself. He would neglect looking after his home himself. On the other hand, the Prophet ﷺ would be out all day. He would bring back the bread and butter. But Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha would equally look after the home. She would nurture her four daughters, Sayyida Zainab, Sayyida Ruqiya, Sayyida Umm Kulsum and Sayyida Fatima radiallahu anhunna ajma'een. Who was the one who was nurturing these girls, looking after them, educating them, teaching them, bringing them up, teaching them uh, how to be 
good women in society, how to be women who stand up for principles and who make sacrifice for the sake of, of their principles. It was Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha. And Sayyida Khadija made her house for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in such a manner that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave her glad tidings and said, Allah gives you glad tidings of a house in Jannah لا صخب فيه ولا نصب in which there will be no raising of voices and no argumentation. The question is, no house in Jannah will have argumentation and, and tie them. Isn't that right? Are you guys expecting to have arguments in Jannah? Are you leaving them behind here? You taking the arguments with you? Huh? Allah says in, uh, in the Quran, when you get there, Allah will when Allah said we will remove from their hearts all types of ghil, uh, all types of uh, d uh, harsh feelings that they have between them. We will remove them from each other's hearts, right? So, what I'm thinking about is, is that the Prophet ﷺ said to Sayyida Khadija, your house in Jannah will be a house which doesn't have la sakhaba fihi wa la nasab, no raising of voices and no tiredom. Question is, aren't all of the houses in Jannah like this? Obviously they will be like this. Nobody is going to be arguing and nobody is going to get, be getting tired. So why was the house of Sayyidah Khadija specifically mentioned like this? The reason why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned his, her house specifically like this is because he wanted the house of Sayyidah Khadija to be an example for the women of Islam. He wanted the house of the uh, he wanted the houses of the women to uh, the, he wanted the house of Sayyidah Khadija to be an example for the women of Islam. In that, the house of Sayyidah Khadija upon the earth that she created for the Prophet وسلم, was a house in which there was no raising of voices and no tiredom. So Allah gave her a reward which was similar and described her house in Jannah in a similar manner to indicate to us the reason why she is being granted a house like this in Jannah because this is the type of house that she created upon the earth for the Prophet So it's the job of the woman in the house, of the wife, to make the house a pleasant place. To make the house a place where there is not tiredom. Tiredom should be outside of the house. When you come in the house, everything should be calm. And you know a beautiful hadith that I read, read very recently, that the Prophet wasallam he said, Homes, homes in which you do not find argumentation, and homes in which you do not find uh, tiredom and conflict, are homes in which in reality the angels have spread out their wings. And it's because of the comfort of those angels in, in, the, in the homes that there is no arguments, that there is no conflict, that there is no trouble going on. But the homes in which there is not mutual understanding, there is a conflict, then from those homes the angels raise their wings and raise themselves from those homes. So we see that in Makkah al-Mukarramah the Prophet ﷺ didn't give up working because his wife was rich. And this is something that we need to understand in the modern society because many of the women folk of Islam are now working as long as they are working in respectful uh, places where their dignity is honored, where they are uh, given their rights, where they are uh, uh, treated well, then this is fine. The women of Islam have always been working. It's not a new phenomena, right? If, uh, in, in the earlier days, women used to go out into the fields uh, into agriculture, if they were agricultural people, they would uh, p uh, go out into the fields and work alongside men, or other women who used to go to the marketplaces and buy and sell and so on and so forth. Uh, working for the Muslim woman is not something new, it's always been, right? So in the, if in the modern society, the Muslim women are working uh, and they find respectful jobs and where their dignity is honored, then that's fine. But that does not make the husband think, you know what, oh, this is excellent. She can look after the home and she can bring back the bread and butter too. Uh, I can go on a holiday now. The Prophet ﷺ didn't do it like this. Even though his wife was so rich and affluent, he himself 
was still engaging in fulfilling the duties of his home even though his wife was so rich and affluent but his wife she contributed out of her generosity out of a charitable nature she contributed towards the house so that they can have a better life between them but that did not take away the manhood responsibility from the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this is something we need to ponder upon in the life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we have a major problem in in muslim societies now uh, whereby muslims think okay if she is working then she can deal with all of the matters of the home right she deals with the children at home anyway she can go and buy buy food for them too from her wealth i don't need to provide for her no this is not correct then we see in his medinan life that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was so gentle and he was so soft and kind with his wives one day 70 women came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in medina 70 women how many 70 you know what they did they complained about their husbands 70 and the women of medina were women of courage they were women of courage and bravery right they they didn't shy away from things i give you an example you know the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to make khutbah in madinatul munawwara standing beside a tree yeah and uh, one day sayyidina umar came and he started to cry he said ya rasul allah the kings and the emperors of the world they have big thrones and i see you standing by a tree and making khutbah right he just cried and then what happened soon soon after a woman from the women of ansar from the women of medina came and she saw the same she said messenger of allah you don't have a seat to sit on he said i stand by this tree and i deliver khutbah she went away do you know what she did she built a member for him and brought it back she built a member for him and brought it back what did the scholar say the man just cried the woman got the job done right the man just cried the woman got the job done right so the women of medina were cr- courageous they were brave women they would come out and speak out for their rights 70 of them came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that evening what did the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam say to his companions he said khayrukum khayrukum li nisaikum wa ana khayrukum li ahli the best of you are the best of you for your wives and i am the best of you for my wives and he said ma akramahunna illa karim wa ma ahanahunna illa laim he said only the noble people honor their women and only the lowly abased people dishonor their women right so the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not only teaching his sahaba how to stand in prayer how to buy and sell how to recite the quran but he's also teaching them how to live in the most intimate places of their homes with their wives with their children and how to interact with them you know the sahaba when they came to islam there was some much somewhat of a culture clash for them why what culture did they come from they came from the culture that allah mentions in the quran wa iza al-maw'udatu su'ilat bi ayyi dhanbin qutilat they came from this culture which is that the young infant girl will ask on the day of judgment by which sin was i killed they came from this culture that if they had a daughter born in their homes they would go as far as burying that girl alive they came from the culture where when a woman would be menstruating she would not be allowed to stay in the house she'd be locked outside she would not be allowed to interact with the family and cook and eat with the family they came from the culture where women were not given inheritance they came from the culture where women were just like slaves even their wives so when they came to islam there was a big culture clash for them they had to reprogram their mind as to how we going to interact with our women folk now because islam gave their women folk so much rights that they would come out to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and say speak to my husband he's not behaving 
right? So Islam gave the women folk this status and this rank that if they are not treated well, that they come out and speak, right? But if they are treated well and they are looked after, that they must also stand up to their responsibilities and they must also take up their responsibilities of looking after the house, uh, looking after the children, caring for the home. We, we live in a very strange time. One of my teachers from Damascus, he was a great Shafi'i Faqih. Somebody came to him and said, said Sayyid, do you know my wife? She's saying uh, I should do the cooking. My wife is saying I should be doing the cooking. And she's, she's not going to do the cooking. And the Sheikh said, fine, go and, cook for, go and cook for a few days. The Sheikh said, fine, go and cook for a few days. Let's see what happens. He said, okay. He went. He said to his wife, I'll do the cooking. She was happy. One day, two or three days later, she said, you know what, move aside. Let me do it myself. He came back to the Sheikh and he said, it worked. The Sheikh said, do you know what, why it worked? Because when you cook food, it needs texture, it needs care, it needs love, it needs tenderness, it needs uh, color, it needs uh, uh, ease. Huh? All of these are traits which men won't have, the women have. Just think about it. Uh, if you look around us here at the front, we've all near enough got the same color clothing on, right? And not too much difference. If you look at the women folk, they will have much more color in their clothing, right? They will have much more style in their clothing. Why? Because we're boring people. Men are boring, right? So if you find, bring a boring person to cook uh, uh, food, you're not going to be eating that food for long, right? So there are certain things that women do from their nature, and they have qualities in their nature that bring bring uh, that are bought out within the things that they do and from amongst that is from is from is, is in cooking the food right and they have a love that they place in the food that men don't have men are too uh, are too quick are too busy in their minds where, whereas women find ease and they uh, they have extra care and you know when they are cooking they think about the people who they will be feeding right what my friends he said to me one of my friends said to me that uh, his parents were sitting, his mother and father were sitting, and uh, the father said, uh, I, I want to eat my food. So food was presented to him and he began to eat, and the mother didn't eat. My friend said, my mother said to my father, my mother said to my father, look, my son hasn't come home yet. I will not eat until he comes up. But you men, you don't care. Whether your son has come home or not, you, you want to eat your food. She said, this is the difference between a mother and a father. This is the difference between a mother and a father. The father will think, oh, he'll deal with himself. He, he'll be able to look after himself. He'll find food somewhere. I need to eat. Whereas the mother will go hungry until the child eats. Right? This tenderness and care will not be found in men. It's found in women. This texture is only found in women. So we have this trend going around the Muslims, right? Whereby they think that, uh, you know, the laws of Islam, the books of fiqh, the books of fiqh are books of law for the courtroom, right? For the judge in the courtroom, that he opens up the books of fiqh and says, okay, you know, uh, this is the ruling on this and this is the ruling on this. But if you live your life by the books of fiqh, you're going to realize that your life has become very boring and it's become very restricted and it's become uh, unbearable. Right? It's become unbearable. Because if you have to follow the courtroom rulings every time in every matter that you deal with, you're going to have problems. You're going to have problems. I'll give you an example. If if the wife denies or doesn't want to breastfeed her child, then the husband will have to go and find somebody who will breastfeed the child. Right? Now, this is worst case scenario. This is worst case scenario. This is not a scenario which is normal. 
But nowadays, some Muslims are starting to take these scenarios to be normal scenarios, right? And they want to live by these scenarios so that they can shun off from themselves the responsibility of family life. The way men want to shun off from themselves bringing food home and being uh, uh, the one who brings bread and butter home and the one who goes and earns and has this responsibility of the home. Likewise, the women folk are learning also how to shun off the responsibilities of the home. Now, if the man and the woman both want to shun off the responsibilities of, of life, then what do we have left? We have shambles. We have destruction. We have breakdown. We have children ending up in the social services uh, with foster parents, right? And we have parents with a breakdown in communication and a lost society at large. So it's very important in our lives that we stick to the prophetic uh, teachings of how to live like a husband and how to live like a wife from the uh, uh, from the lives of the blessed wives of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is something very important. I know sometimes people think, oh, we have progressed so much. It's been 1400 years since the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, one of our teachers, he said, he said, look, human beings from the time of Adam Alaihi Salam till this time are no different in their nature. Our intrinsic nature is absolutely the same. We haven't changed. Right? And you see this in children. A child today was a child like yesterday, was like a child a thousand years ago. There's nothing different. We're absolutely the same. It's just the glamour of the world has camouflaged our human nature from ourselves. So therefore we follow after the glamour of the world that has accelerated with science and technology and made us more monkey-like than human-like. Make, made us more monkey-like than human-like. Now it's time that we revert and turn back to being humankind. And this is why I often say, it is from the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the blessed life of the Prophet sallallahu has been registered for us and recorded. For we have reached a stage where man doesn't even know how to be like man. Humans don't even know how to operate like humans. So had it not been for the life of the Prophet sallallahu being registered and his life and his person is a person who is uh, at the pinnacle of humanity before anything else. Before he announced he was a prophet, the 40 years that he lived amongst the Makkans, the 40 years he lived amongst the Makkans, what did they describe his 40 years as? As sadiq, truthful, honest, trustworthy, uh, the most kind, the most gentle, uh, the most accepted. All of these qualities of humanity that he had, were long before his announcement of prophethood and messengership. So we have, got, we have to return back to the life of the Prophet ﷺ to see that even though his wife was working, he didn't throw the responsibility, his responsibility of bringing back bread and butter onto his wife. Even though he was having a hard time in the Meccan society outside his home, he did not bring those burdens of life back into his home and likewise his blessed wives they did not operate in a way whereby they thought we should be served now look the prophet ﷺ's household was the royal household of islam it's the royal family of islam his wives could have sat back and said you know what all of the people of medina should come and serve us we're not doing any chores at home sayyida fatima zahra radiallahu anha you know when she married sayyidina ali radiallahu an you know what she said? She said, all of the work that I was doing at home, my hands were covered with blisters. My hands were covered with blisters. This is Sayyida Fatima radiallahu anha. And when she came to the Prophet ﷺ to ask for a slave, what did the Prophet say? The Prophet said, I am not going to leave Ahlu Sufa, my companions who sit in the masjid. I'm not going to leave them. Their stomachs are cringing from hunger and give you a slave. Which father does not wish for his daughter to be at rest? No father. Another time she came to the Prophet ﷺ, wanted to ask for a slave. She was too shy. Sayyidina Ali came. They asked for a slave. The Prophet ﷺ said, I'll give you something that will suffice you of that. 
recite subhanallah 33 times alhamdulillah 33 times and allahu akbar 34 times before sleeping and that will suffice you of a slave he didn't say oh well you're working so hard perhaps you need this help no that was the royal family of islam and the women of that household were looking after the home whilst the men were working in society and the men would not come back home and throw their burdens upon their wives but they would interact with them in the softest of ways in the gentlest of ways in the kindest of ways right now nowadays perhaps we need to have a curfew on ourselves that before we enter into our homes that we need to switch off our mobile phones we need to switch off our mobile phones because even if we are in our homes we are not interacting with our families because we have interaction on our phones and and the case has become so weird in society that the husband and wife will be sitting in the same room the mother and father will be sitting in the same room instead of speaking to each other they'll send a whatsapp for some reason it's more amusing right for some reason it's more amusing and that's because technology has overtaken our lives right technology is a good tool to have as long as we use it within its parameters but if we for if we give up our human life and replace it with technology then the destruction that is hitting the households of the world muslim and non will end up coming to us also this is why we have spoken about what we've spoken about is that the tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for us of science and technology should not take over our human nature should not take over our human life because if they take over our human life then it's better that we have no more reproduction of human beings but rather we have factories where robots are produced it's better that we don't have any more reproduction of human beings it's better that we have robots factories where robots are produced and they can live with each other and when you have robots what's missing in a robot the soul the ruh is missing in a robot and most human beings have become like those robots technology and science have taken over their lives and they have lost the sense of a soul and when a person loses the sense of a soul then qualities of kindness are lost the quality of genuine sincerity is lost the quality of genuine care for each other and for Allah's creation is lost and so on and so forth so we have to return to being a combination of body and soul within our homes the men need to return to their manhood and the women need to return to their womenhood right women need to and this is something important the Prophet ﷺ said one of the signs of the end of time is that men would want to behave like women and women would want to behave like men we have to take a heed we have to take heed from this statement of the messenger of Allah sallallahu and we have to behave and be careful that we don't fall into this trap of becoming the opposite but rather we stay within our own boots and we don't take them off and put on the heels and the women don't take off the heels and put on the boots right and so long as we are doing this then we will have harmony we will have ease and comfort and when we divorce ourselves from this then we may as well live like robots we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he not allow us to fall into the traps of the shaitan and the deceptions of the time whereby our men want to be like women and our women like want to be like men but rather we stay within our human natures and operate that as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained for us to operate wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen